Welcome to this session. Uh, this is the first of a series of sessions, and it's hosted by the Center for Experimental Practices at University of Huddersfield. Uh, I am here hosting it, of course, it, in uh, Huddersfield, which is in Northern England, um, but people may be joining us from elsewhere. And uh, as people come, um, Colin, if you just want to let them in. Uh, you're welcome to have your videos on or off. Um, and and uh, at the end, there'll certainly be plenty of time for conversation. I just want to make a few introductory remarks, uh, first about the center and the series before I introduce the show. Um, there's an increasingly common practice that probably many people know about of a land acknowledgement, and I have not yet come across any really satisfactory land acknowledgement pertaining to England. Uh, and have not figured out exactly what that would be. But I think if it were, if I were heading in that direction, and perhaps at the end, by the end of this event series, something will be more formulated, and I welcome feedback towards that. Um, it would be something along the lines that um, England and the United Kingdom, as Franz Fanon said about Europe, are constructions of a colonial process, and all of the peoples who have been colonized by England in the past centuries, um, their right to travel and live and work in England if they desired, but also to vote and to influence the future of the United Kingdom as a concept is, to use a carefully chosen word, unseated. I'll start with Center for Experimental Practices. This is a new interdisciplinary center at University of Huddersfield where we are thinking about questions like what is a research center, what is research, what a university can be. Uh, this is a, a new center, it has a number of people involved and so we're finding our direction. Um, but I want to thank Colin Frank who is here in the background working on this meeting technically and also uh, who is the center manager and also Kate Holden who is the program manager who has been working with me on curating this series. This series is the first uh, launching this new center um, and I'm quite excited about it. Uh, it. The Lines of Flight series has actually existed before in many various incarnations prior to this version of the Research Center. And it's always been um, an open public research seminar series looking at the boundaries of what research can be and what we need research to be today. This series, which will unfold over the next five weeks, um, called Black Methods, or Lines of Flight Black Methods, is um, very much, of course, influenced by developments in Black studies in North America. Uh, and following the work of people like Catherine McKittrick and others, is looking at the landscape, particularly of artistic research and of practice research in the UK and Europe, uh, and thinking about how vital it is uh, as we think about the cultural politics and, the, and the, the broader implications of these ideas like practice research or artistic research um, to widen the scope very broadly of what is understood by artistic research or practice research to acknowledge all the things that are uh, all the radical practices of artistic research and practice research that don't necessarily get collated under that name uh, and particular to think about and to learn from Blackness, not only as an identity category, but also as a field of knowledge and as a radical intervention in ideas of research, knowledge, epistemology, and method. Um, so with that in mind, that's just kind of a background for the overall series and the information about the series and about the center can be found on our webpage, which I'll just post in the chat. And it's really just a kind of a landing page, which will continue to grow over the coming months and hopefully direct you to more and more interesting events. But I hope that um, you will, people who are here will also continue and come back for some of the other events in this series and other events that we may organize in the future. Um, in terms of housekeeping for the meeting, uh, the, the, the team's functionality is not unfolding quite exactly as I had expected it to. Um, in terms of people being in the meeting, everything, but basically this is a regular Teams meeting. It's not structured in the other kinds of ways that they can be structured. So that means the chat is open. Um, if you would like to contribute comments or questions during the kind of initial presentation, you're very welcome to do that. Um, and, uh, and, and, that and, and then of course, afterwards, there will also be time if you would rather 
make a comment or ask a question um, in, in your audio visual form to turn on your video or turn on your audio. Um, and I will moderate that after the presentation. So those, without further ado, let me introduce Sean Crawley, who I'm so excited to be uh, introducing and, and bringing to present about his work. Um, I've been following Sean's work for a number of years and I've seen um, an incredible grace and deftness in moving between different contexts and different disciplines and an incredible generosity um, and brilliance in, 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 in making connections and in doing things that are, in Ashan's terms, otherwise possibility, sometimes in relation to the university, sometimes outside it or in all the kinds of different configurations we can think about. Ashan is um, a scholar based at University of Virginia, a scholar of religious studies and Black studies, and also very much involved in music, musicology, I'm not sure how to frame it, and performance studies, and queer studies, and many other fields, um, but also uh, uh, an incredible visual artist um, who I've, has an extraordinarily beautiful um, painting, or I'm not sure if it's entirely painting, but a visual art practice that is uh, also really beautiful and really inspiring. And looking at Ashan's paintings and visual works and writings, which also move fluidly from a very scholarly tone to a very personal tone. Uh, I've just been very inspired in terms of these questions about what a university can be, what it should be, what research can be, how, how research can support life uh, and the kinds of knowledges that we so desperately need. So that all just makes me very, very happy to uh, invite Ashan to present about his work um, today here in the context of this series. Please, Ashwin, thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction and for the invitation as well to join you all. Um, it's always a joy to share work and it's always kind of strange too, mostly because <clears throat> I feel like the life that I'm living was in a life that I anticipated. Excuse me, I was just on my undergraduate campus Saturday, um, I had done a commissioned work for honoring the life of one of the people who was a mentor and a friend of mine, um, and still is, she still is a friend of mine, um, and still I would say still is a mentor. Um, I was So I was there to unveil the piece um, as a part of the unveiling of two different pieces, mine was one of them. And it was just very strange to be standing in a classroom that I stood or that I sat in and fought, fell asleep in as an undergrad because I was quite a terrible student. But I graduated 20 years ago this week from my undergraduate studies. And one of the things I said was the life that I'm living now could not have been anticipated then. And so, so much of what has happened in literally in my life since um, I left undergraduate studies has been, um, it's been very joyous, but it's also been very difficult. And so the work that I have been working on most recently, if you know anything about my work, I write a lot about joy. Um, I write about joy within the context of um, Black sacred traditions, religiosity, Pentecostalism. But I am not giving up on joy, but I am talking about difficulty and struggle. And so my goal for today is to read, and it's titled versions because the things that I'm doing are different versions of the same thing. Um, I'm currently writing a book titled Made Instrument, which is about the AIDS crisis and how it impacted Black communities in the United States. And one, doing a prehistory of the AIDS crisis, um, between 1935 and 1980 to think about the various failures of state, um, of local, state, and federal government to care for Black people. And then in the 1980s, seeing the impact of the AIDS crisis and how instead of an ongoing critique of the political economic order, instead people internalize the failures of government as personal, moral, and ethical failures of sinfulness of people. So the crack um, cocaine crisis at the same time that you have the crisis in AIDS, 
And so a lot of people are sermonizing against people and their sin as opposed to like the government, which I think is a really important and terrible shift. And so I'm writing this book that's trying to think about the AIDS crisis. And I focus on musicians, choir directors, and singers from the Black church communities who died of AIDS complications because it is a well known non secret that the change that there is a change in the sound of gospel music around about 1996 and one of the reasons why there's this huge change in the sound of gospel is because of the deaths of so many musicians so many choir directors people who are actually producing the sound that churches are singing um so that's one thing that i'm doing i'm also doing an installation um, for the National Mall um, here in the United States, which is located in Washington, D.C. And the title of the installation is Homegoing, which is why the video for this won't be published or made available publicly until after August, because none of what I'm saying is on the record right now. One, because the federal government still has not finally approved my fifth and hopefully final design for the installation. Um, but I will be showing uh, slides from the fabricators and what I designed, what they are trying to create, and I'll be playing some music that I've written that acquired that I will, excuse me, acquire that I will be working with, acquire 12 people who will be singing to record the music so that people can experience this sound installation. And so I'm going to read a little bit from the book, then show a little bit of the visual for the installation and then play some of the music. Thank you for having me. Um, and this is from a chapter titled Cassettes right now. You have to imagine what it was like during my early adolescent years, the late 1980s, the early 1990s, we had a VCR and I used it to record and rewatch all kinds of things, everything from episodes of Jim and the Holograms that I recorded toward the end of one particular video cassette so my parents wouldn't know that I was watching a television show for girls, to episodes of Bobby Jones Gospel, sermons from local access stations and others. Video cassettes helped me figure out things in music that I loved. Video cassettes also help me sense for how each of us differently music stays with you and remains and endures. But two video cassettes help me to notice how not everything stays, how not everything remains, how, er, how not everything endures, some things leave. There were disappearances and videos captured that disappearance of sound made flesh, a flesh made instrument. Father, pastor, mother, preacher, brother, musician, me, singer, we attended church almost daily and we fellowship with lots of churches, both New Jersey, New York, and though less frequently, um, other states as well. Members of the Pentecostal organization, the Church of God in Christ, my sense of belonging and community was felt because there were annual gatherings at our church in other local churches and in Memphis, Tennessee, Church of God in Christ's headquarters. One year, my parents attended the Holy Convocation in 1991, um, November. My brother and I stayed behind in New Jersey. Our uncle Thomas, my father's oldest brother, kept us for part of the trip. And because the New Jersey Public Schools had its annual teachers convention through the New Jersey Education Association, I was able to stay at my uncle's house during the day, both Thursday and Friday of that week. He had a lot of video cassettes <clears throat> from church services, gospel concerts, and live choir recordings. I watched one particular video of a choir from the Delaware Valley and was moved. There was a song about being prepared for a difficult life, but enduring. There was a song about how nice it is to be on the Lord's side. And there was a song about good news. I watched the video over and over again, but not because of the singing. Those two days I watched it over and over again because I could not believe what I was witnessing, something still difficult for many to name because there still is so much shame. The leader of the choir, its director was dying. It was apparent. Too young, he had an emaciated body, hair thinning and balding, and at times a voice that would crack, stretch and leave. I knew he, quote, had AIDS. 
and knew too that he was a sinner because he was very apparently gay. I knew these things about him because it was the early 90s. The video was recorded and released in 1990. And rumors and gossip, sorry, the audio cassette was released in 1990. The video cassette was released in 1992, very important. Rumors and gossip circulated, immaterial whispers, hushed conversations were had about people that were here yesterday, directing the choir, playing the Hammond organ, leading solos, sometimes all three, today, gone quite literally tomorrow. There were so many stories told about so-and-so, so much, so, so, so-and-so and such and such, so much so that I was as a young person afraid that something in the music was making these men queer. The gossip was supposed to protect families, supposedly innocent from the stigma of having a sinful and dying son, grandson, nephew, cousin, or friend. But this gossip intensified the stigma for the musicians, the choir directors, and the singers. It was within this context that I became afraid of becoming a musician, a choir director, or to really sing in the Black Pentecostal Church of my familiar. Even though I love the music, how it moved me, swayed me, and made me feel. Because if they were dying because of the music, would I die too? I was entranced um, because though this choir director was there in the flesh of magnetic tape rendering the image and sound, it felt like he was already gone. In the middle of the video during a protracted praise break, the choir director stopped everything to say the following. The doctor said I wouldn't live. The doctor said I wouldn't make it. I lost all this weight, didn't know what was going to happen. But I want you to know that I give God praise. I want you to know God is a healer. If you need healing, God is a healer. If you need deliverance, God is a deliverer tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I tell you, this thing is for real. We're not playing church. We may not live like you want us to live, but we love God. And this is a time that we need to stop playing church and let God have his way. I just thought of something, y'all. Sorry. When you are in the middle of writing a book, when you think of things, you have to you have to mark it because this whole idea of we need to stop playing around is something that comes back over and over. It's the same language. Sorry. So he says these things. The next year, 1991, the year after the audio cassette was released, the choir director died. A year before the video recording was released, the video recording about God's healing power. Section two, sometimes the presence of ghosts is most intensely felt in music, a chord change, a beat drop, a bass note, a song fade. Music and sound remain in your flesh after the vibrations are since registered and felt. Sometimes you hum it, sometimes it's simply stuck in your head, even if you hate it. Sometimes an occasion for nostalgia, though you think about that girl you love, that boy you missed, the one that you kissed. Sometimes a question, you sense and feel the edges of the song. What is that song again? The quality it left with you, but its actual shape escapes like a faded picture and broken dream. Whether a church is placed in the history of Chicago and thus the history of black gospel music and thus, the, thus and also the history of black popular music, or the unspoken but real deaths of musicians, choir directors, and singers, primarily but not only men, to the AIDS um, epidemic, especially in the 1980s and 90s, listening to music can be a daunting and haunting affair. I've always had an affinity for the sound of the Hammond organ. It haunts me like no other. It was heard in the video that I watched as a kid at my uncle's house, the sonic foundation against which the choir projected their voices the sonic foundation within which the choir director announced the healing powers of God. A lingering presence, the sound of the Hammond organ is backgrounded like a ghost in a ghosting. Heard in the blues, jazz, rock and roll, R&B, funk, soul. The sound of the Hammond organ's ubiquity for black folks began with the church on Wabash Avenue in Chicago. And genius, not as identity, but as practice was created there and moved and spread. With the invention of the Hammond organ in the 1930s, black musicians' performances helped to make it the first commercially successfully marketed electric instrument. They harnessed its currents and spin to practice joy and vibrancy and spirit. They played it in ways the inventor, Lawrence Hammond, who once worked with Birth of the Nations, D.W. Griffith, after the film was released. Um, they played it in ways that the 
inventor surely would have hated, pulling out all the draw bars, making the sound as loud and as grating as possible. Perhaps the music they made in general, he would have hated because it was so black. A conundrum as American as apple pie, because the reason why we remember Lawrence Hammond is the very thing that he hated, black folks. Angela Y. Davis says that a unique contribution that black people make in a post-emancipation world from Jim Crow onward is in music, exploring with intention and explicitness eroticism and sexuality. In black music, sex and sexualities then are zones of experimentation, zones of exploration and full of uncertainty. And Hammond organists within the black church context along with choir directors like the one from the Delaware Valley and singers too, were transformed into a sign and symbol of this new exploratory and experimental thinking in the early 20th century, such that black church musicianship on the Hammond organ is one way to sense the ghostly matters of experiments and, and explorations. Musicians within this context are conduits that allow us to feel the ephemeral and immaterial because in their practice, they help us to sense haunting, the lingering presence of possibility, movement beyond limit of intention, of desire, of doctrine. I think about the chord changes and progressions, the arpeggios and modulations Hammond organists make and play. For me, a certain playing always got up and still gets up in my flesh. The sounds went through the intention of my desired decorum and stateness of control, showing my flesh to be porous and open and available for urging for incitement to praise. Sometimes I would, after hearing a chord progression that was felt viscerally jump up from my seat or my pew, throw my hands up, getting happy, leap in joy, shout in praise, worship in ecstasy. And it was never just me. It was always a social practice. The Hammond organist, when skilled, enraptures us. Their sounds caressing and carrying and caressing the movement of the musician's hands and feet through the key changes and modulations, coaxing, convoking, and arousing. That they can produce both arousal, both excites and worries, fascinates and terrifies. Because if the congregants can be moved to praise, can they also be moved towards the vulgar and the sinful? The sound of the hymn and organ compels non-coercive movement, a kind of erotics for sonic suggestion. A Hammond organist skill when fully realized always felt to me like holy terror and dread because of the bigness and expansiveness and uncontrollable and uncontainable nature of existence is what they seem to play on the instrument. Black, black church musicians playing on the Hammond have a, terrible, a terribly beautiful opportunity to make folks sense beyond the edges of the material world and find delight and joy there even when it is scary. Like the first kiss shared between boys, knowing hell is real and possible and there with the kiss, but they do it anyway. These musicians sense beyond the edge of the borders and boundaries and find life and joy and celebration there. Lampooned in comedy, attacked in sermonizing the music in the black church and the Hammond organist as a carrier of the tradition is a space of worry. The idea of the male choir director, the male soloist, and the male hymn and organist emerged in the early, early 20th century, stereotyping these men as failing masculinity, manhood, fatherhood, and patriarchy. Their purported failure stood in for a range of queer possibilities, possibilities functioning like apparitional weight. There was the presence of queerness in Black churches from the beginning, but also its disavowal, the renunciation of such possibility the love of the flamboyant singer, the gaudy jewelry of the musician, but also the refusal to think the presence of this queerness as possibility. Their songs still sung and rehearsed and performed today, even when succumbing to the crisis of an epidemic, their music haunts. Labor there, but flesh forgotten, labor apparent, but flesh demeaned, dismissed and discarded. What does it mean to be the musician of this instrument? Section three. Renunciation is the general problem of our moment of this long historical post-1492 temporal measure because renunciation names the force in the form of imagining the possibility of relation and after having imagined it, refusing it. Because what does it mean for a navigator from Genoa, Italy to perform a series of expeditions to a so-called new world he thought was the Indies? And after having arrived and having encountered difference, deemed the people insufficient and deficient. It is, at, it, 
it at least meant that the people encountered were not Christian and thus their land was able to be taken, stolen, and that their people were available to harm and exploitation. What could, what could have been the possibility for relation, for imagining beyond and be, for imagining being in communion and learning from one another with no other goal than being in the world with difference, Instead, whatever learning took place was in the service of a political economy that he, one Cristoforo Colon, carried in him, in his flesh, a political economy that was both already established and also in process of becoming what it would be for him and thus for us today, to encounter difference and to register it as insufficient, as a problem to remediate and to remove. We've been here a long time doing this thing, refusing one another, refusing care, refusing friendship. In 1972, the same year that Motown closed their Detroit operation, two years before Detroit elected its first black mayor, Bailey Temple Church of God in Christ, the Black Pentecostal congregation founded in 1926 by John Seth and wife Anna J. Bailey, relocated to the former Adat Shalom Synagogue in the University District of Detroit, Michigan. John, Seth, and Anna Jay began their, began a church in their house in the basement in 1926. They felt moved by the spirit to begin a congregation. The Church of God in Christ was still new, um, which began in 1930, I'm sorry, in 1896, so just 30 years in operation. But like many in the organization at the time, John Seth and wife Anna felt called and heeded the call. They were able to have worship in a storefront until 1972 when they purchased the former synagogue. Detroit, Michigan, the city had been through a lot of political unrest and the rebellions that some call riots that were fundamentally about economic inequality, police violence, and, misleader and the misleadership of the political class kept happening. White people in the city had become increasingly uncomfortable with Black people moving into the formerly red line zoned segregated areas. And though white flight began as early as the 1950s, it was not until after the 1967 rebellions that a major movement of people um, relocated to the suburbs, white people and Jewish people as well. But how does white flight happen? White flight is a colloquialism that imprecisely names the violence of settler colonialism and its movement and force throughout the various lands. White flight is really an economic and political condition of renunciation, of refusing relation. In Detroit in 1950 on, what we can think about, about white flight as the renouncing of relation to Black folks in the same way that the silence regarding the AIDS um, crisis eviscerating the Black church is a renunciation of Black queer people, about which more soon. Detroit is home to, of the Anishinaabe nations of the Council of Three Fires. The land was ceded, in quotes, in 1807. William Hud, Hull, the governor of the Michigan Territory, wrote in the treaty, quote, to conform and perpetuate the friendship which happily subsists between the United States and nations aforesaid, to manifest the sincerity of that friendship and to settle arrangements mutually beneficial to the parties. After full exploration and perfect understanding, the following articles are agreed to, which when ratified by the president, by and with the advice of consent of the, of the Senate of the United States shall be binding on them and the respective nations of Indians." End quote. To name friendship and happiness as the basis for the displacement is important. Like white flight conceptually, the words friendship and happiness veil the violence of settler colonialism, the taking of land and reproducing it through a logic, of, through a logic anathema to the people that were thereon. White flight is occasioned by the displacement that precedes it, in other words. White flight is the name and sign for that which has already been underway, a settler logic of land displacement, theft, and violence. White flight is possible because settler colonialism was already in practice, was already happening. And it is a violence of progression and movement because it was not just of white people from a particular area. It was also the forcing of a particular people to occupy particular spaces. What emerged in the 50s as a redlining against black folks with the destabilizing of Detroit, 
of the Detroit metropolis and the acceptance of police violence was prefigured by the ongoing theft, the treaty making, um, the claim but not real friendship and happiness of settler logics. Um, and this was all possible because of the anti-Semitism that proceeds. Detroit can become a city precise because of what had been shadowed and shadowed out, what is there but also displaced and unspoken. Detroit was and still is today known for its sound, the Motown sound. Motown because it was known as the Motor City, home to Chrysler, Ford, Cadillac, and others. Labor and political economic forces are named and claimed in the word Motel, quote, the rebuilding of the center of Detroit beginning in 1967 as a response to rebellion there proposed by the new Detroit committee would mean that eventually the blacks, Appalachians and students who inhabited that area between the Riverfront Commercial Center and Wayne State University area would be removed to make room for a revitalized core city repopulated by middle and upper middle class representatives of the city's various racial and ethnic groups. And in the first six years of the new Detroit committee's existence, the quality of life in the city deteriorated to a new low. The industrial workers who made up more than 35% of the population were hardest hit. They found that the new Detroit meant working longer hours, um, working longer and faster and paying higher taxes in exchange for diminishing city services and for wage gains more than outpaced by inflation. Black workers continue to hold the most arduous, dangerous, and unhealthy jobs. Their moves toward job improvement, union office, and shop floor reform were resisted by the company, the unions, and even their fellow workers. The Black population also bore much more of the burden of curtailed public services, especially the nearly non-existent public trans transit and a school system on the verge of bankruptcy." End quote. The impact on Black workers and the Black population should have been an ethical crisis, but did not register as such. And it's because the violence against Black folks was precipitated by the settler logic of displacement that Cristoforo Colombo inaugurated such that sounding out from the city, whatever that sound might be, could be considered to be an elaboration on and commentary about the crisis that was not one for at least some. White flight is a movement predicated upon several logics, predicated upon the assumption that there's always land available to be inhabited and that such inhabitation through displacement and appropriative measures do not in the white imagination produce a crisis or concept of failure that the land was worked by enslaved people, land that was stolen and thus veils the labor of indigenous people, means that an unethical force elaborated in the sonic sociality to which I attend is the ongoing nature of displacement, dispossession, and recognition. In other words, if you listen to the ways that Black folks sing out in, in Detroit, you might get a sense for the kind of ethical crises they were trying to contend against. And perhaps it was not a crisis Perhaps it was not a crisis too, because there was an exploitation of black genius. In an article titled To Honor Church Worker, published in the Michigan Chronicle, November 21st, 1964, so moving backwards a little bit, it's an article about a celebration of Dr. Maddie Moss Clark. It states, quote, for more than nine years, she directed and played the organ for the Founders Choir of Cadillac Motor Company. In the same periodical, the next year, November 6, 1965, it says, Mrs. Clark also trained the Cadillac Foundry Chorus of Detroit. Maddie Moss Clark was not just the director and organist, um, no doubt a Hammond of the Founders Choir, um, the Foundry Chorus of Detroit, I'm sorry, of Cadillac in Detroit. She was also a minister of music of Bailey Temple, Church of God in Christ. She too was the mother of the now infamous group, the Clark Sisters, who would go on to international fame beginning with their performances at their home church. She was also director of the Southwest Michigan State Mass Choir and as well the minister of music for the entire Church of God in Christ organization. She was important in other words, and her being tapped by Cadillac as early as 1955 meant something. Was this a response to the post-war downturn in black unemployability? The boys returning from overseas beginning in 1945, displacing black labor and women's labor that was used, exploited because motor companies like Ford, Chrysler, and General, General Motors 
Um, was General Motors attempting to re de radicalize movement on shop floors by getting an organist that knew how to move congregations? What remains for me to figure out and to investigate are the ways this training and usage of musicality of Black church become a way to be dismissive of Black workers. Is this the predecessor to diversity, equity, and inclusion measures that create opportunities for some at the expenses of the masses? Bailey Temple, which eventually was renamed Bailey Cathedral, would become, in 1979, the location where one of the most important Black Pentecostal music albums the Clark Sisters album, Is My Living in Vain, would be recorded. And sister, El Bernita, Twinkie Clark, skilled musicianship on the Hammond B3 organ, was an anchor for the album's popularity. With the Clark Sisters recording, one hears the density of the space when there is abandonment and reanimation of sound, when there is the leaving and arrival, the breaking away from and coming back to of instruments. To transform such force of testimony, song, shout, happiness, dance into otherwise modality and otherwise feel. Billy Cathedral is exemplary of the black of the genius that can be made from having been renounced. The genius practice that is not thwarted nor destroyed by violent refusals. But Billy Cathedral might also be a place to think about the possibility of the the capturing of that genius, the um, the engulfing of that genius into the political economy for the use of the political economy against the very practice of that genius. I'm skipping. We had to have taken Route 87 North because that is the route one would have taken to get from East Orange, New Jersey to Quebec City. I was in junior high school my second year in the eighth grade. I was in junior in the junior high school then, played the drums, though I mostly hated the exercises and didn't like practicing. I wasn't much good at it, but I was trying to learn and be made instrument for our church. Mr. Patuto, our band teacher, wanted us to experience the world with a bus trip to Canada. I sold Katie Did, which is a candy, it's like turtles, I think. Um, I sold Katie Dids for the school fun fundraiser, and because I sold the most, I was able to get my trip for free. I don't recall much of the trip, some very immature early teen jokes with me and my roommates, my ordering mugu gai pan from a Chinese restaurant in Canada, and folks laughing at it even though it tasted really good, and cassette tapes. I'd gotten a Sony Walkman for Christmas maybe the year previous, and I took it everywhere with me. My friend Edward went to another Black Pentecostal church in East Orange. Um, and, though, and so we shared tapes as we rode up and down from Canada. He let me borrow two cassettes and I listened to them incessantly for seven hours going and eight hours returning. Both were Ronald Winans, Family and Friends, Choirs, Volumes 3 and then 2. On Volume 3, there was a song You Don't Know, which was a particularly moving and funky rhythmic song with Dorinda Clark Cole on the lead. Then there was a song titled The Song of Consecration with Ronald singing with his brother Marvin, the words asking questions like I've never asked before, expecting answers that will unlock every door to a new living way to serve you better in the future is the only reason I'm here today, seeking God in a very solemn way, taking heed to the things I do and say, offering myself to him, I'm coming as a brother and a friend. In the chorus, oh, oh, now I see it's you I need, and with your help, deny myself, put my hand in yours. You have to imagine a 13-year-old Black boy with a strong sense of the spiritual, a deep desire to be holy and sanctified, a hope for a clean future hearing these words, and listening to these words over and over again. Because that 13-year-old Black boy kept feeling kept feeling things that he knew he'd have to destroy in himself in order to have a personal relationship with Jesus. It's as if the song named a longing, but also an action that the boy would have to undergo, full and complete denial of desire and joy that he'd feel as the butterflies in his stomach whenever he thought of that one boy or that other boy. Such delightfulness led to so many tears. The song named the underside of what it would mean not to renounce such denial of desire and joy because there was an epidemic time of Black social life, told in snatches of conversation, whispers, and ephemeral gestures. 
He, this 13-year-old boy, kept rewinding and rewinding and listening and listening again and again. Maybe he could slip into the song itself. Maybe the friend asked for the tape. Maybe the friend Edward asked for the tape back so he could listen to that one. But they exchanged the volume three for the volume two. The boy liked this one a little bit more because it felt more churchy. There was the sound of a ham and organ that was much more pronounced on this particular album. This volume two was released two years previous in 1989. And there was a song titled The Word of God with Elbernita Twinkie Clark, the famous um, from the famous Clark sisters and the Hammond organist singing with Ronald's brother Marvin on the lead. Twinkies famously sings, quote, oh, isn't it funny how things have changed? I remember if you were not holy in the choir, you couldn't sing. But now we go for almost anything. Oh, y'all, we've changed. I can even remember when women were women and uh oh, and then she laughs and then the congregation laughs. Men were men. The congregation laughs again. But now you can hardly tell a her from a him. Oh, y'all, we've changed. Again, you have to imagine a 13-year-old Black boy with a strong sense of the spiritual, um, a deep desire to be holy and sanctified, a hope for a clean future, hearing these words and listening to these words over and over again. Because that 13-year-old boy kept feeling things that he knew he'd have to deny of and in himself in order to have a personal relationship with Jesus. He felt something of the holy that he wanted to be, but was not because of doctrine, because of his shameful and unspoken sin, his desire that he did not ask for, but certainly emerged as an ongoing uncertainty. It's as if the song named a longing that he would have to denounce, a conflation of gender and sexuality, and not living up to the role God desired that God supposedly required. A song that even with laughter had a 13-year-old boy 13 year old black boy consider what he would have to undergo a full and complete denial of desire and joy that he'd feel as the butterflies in his stomach whenever he thought of that one boy of that or that other boy such delightfulness led to so many tears i in 1993 they in 1989 were together all already in what we might consider to be the time of the aids crisis Recorded in Detroit, this song documents the laughter, the screams, because what is happening in Detroit in the 1980s and then early, in the early 1990s for such a bold claim about failures to live up to your correct gender, um, what is the context of that song being sung? And why did these lyrics produce laughter instead of an ethical crisis? Twinkie's laughter veiled and hid from view the refusal to contend with the presence of difference and what the presence of difference would mean for the whole of community. Because in Detroit in the 19 earlys, I'm sorry, in the 1980s and the 1990s, there was so much uncertainty. By 1989, for example, in Detroit, there were 503 HIV diagnoses and 175 deaths and 380 two AIDS diagnoses and 167 deaths. This was when HIV and AIDS were measured differently. And approximately 27% of the new cases were Black folks by 1989. Yet there were songs like those written by Marvin Winans and recorded at Greater Grace Cathedral that lamented the fact that in 1989, there was a time when you could tell when there were women and men, but this is not that time. I've been wondering what to make of the genius art practices and sound and song that musicians living with HIV and dying from AIDS complications has meant for Black community. And I have been wondering what to do with the fact of the death and how their deaths did not precipitate the withdrawing from musical social practices for many of them until they physically could no longer be present in sanctuaries because their spirit was willing, but their flesh was literally too weak. And I've been wondering about how they played and taught and rehearsed each other's songs and sounds for others to hear, learn, and practice from, even while people sang songs and laughed at them and sermonized about them as they sang these songs. There is so much undealt with grief because these musicians living, working, and dying at the same time as other artists, poets, journalists, writers, teachers that did not necessarily leave religious or spiritual communities. 
I've been wondering how to talk about those that not only heard, but perhaps believe the homophobic queer antagonistic doctrine and theology, and perhaps even shared and helped to spread it. How to talk about their inhabiting the time of AIDS and their being afraid of what the virus could do to their flesh, but, not, but could not and would not be out. Not only because they feared losing family and friends, but also because they did not believe their sexuality was itself anything other than a problem for them to overcome. And they made music in that context. I'm skipping, I'm skipping, I'm skipping. In my oral history project, I ask about 1980s, about the 1980s and 90s, about musicianship and queerness. One of my interviewers stunned me and silenced me almost to tears. When she recounted, she said the following quote, now, our number one musician, the guy that played the best, has just been diagnosed with AIDS. No one knew what the heck it was. They didn't understand it. And I remember his family being the only ones going to see him. And this guy was so darn good. He could sing, choir was cutting edge, he was the bomb. She says the name of another musician. I mentioned him already. He was the second person to die in the neighboring town and he could get on the organ and he had the biggest smile and chocolate smooth skin and he didn't look like a pretty man. He was handsome looking, but he was of the life and he could play and never move and be killing it. That's why I said he was smooth like water. He'd play and he he's doing his thing and he didn't sweat. You didn't have to wipe him. None of that because he's just that kind of good. He was smooth and I'm getting teary eyed just thinking about it. And because we did not understand it, we some we people didn't love them to the grave because we didn't understand it. And you're scared of what you tend. And when you're scared, you tend to be discriminatory. And so there are a lot of musicians that died alone during that time. Good people in the ground, all because it was something that wasn't. And then she trails off. And then she says, I remember it. I remember people saying, "Ooh, don't play after him, girl. I'm gonna go wash my hands. I hope you don't catch AIDS because he touched the piano or be careful when you go up there. Don't put your hands in your eyes. He may have sweat and it may have been on his fingers, end quote. What remains of and in the, and in the excluded after having been excluded? This question animates my writing, my teaching and my art practice. There's a deep intimacy in the creation of and breaking with the concepts of genius. Musical genius is not the practice of an individual. Rather, we might consider musical genius as the compression and eventual expression of the social world that made the individual possible. Twinkie Clark, to return to her, experienced loss, and that loss too was made possible by renouncing friendship. Her friend and fellow Detroit musician, Thomas Whitfield, died June 20, 1992, only 38 years old. He had many health complications and many of his, and many of, and many of his, many of their musician, singer, song, writer, choir, director, friends had been dying both in and outside the city of Detroit. Many church folks in the Church of God in Christ and other Black Pentecostal organizations and Baptist churches, Methodist churches, AME churches as well. Music, um, Amber Dromgul says, is, a mess, is messy in the Black church. It's one of the ephemeral atmospheric places in which difficulties and strivings are worked on and worked through and sometimes worked against. At Thomas Whitfield's memorial service, June 26, 1992, Twinkie performed a song titled, I Tried Him and I Know Him. Can we play the first slide now? Even myself. Right, Gwen? And one time we were just joking with each other and he said, uh, can you hear that little clock influence in my music? I said, yeah, Tommy, but can you hear the little Tommy effect in mine? So I thank God that we were able to share musically in the ministry together. And one song, that influenced me to, I'm going to put that 
everybody in my music was a problem and a man and I just like to do a line. <laughs> What she said was every musician tried to get a little Tommy in their music, even myself. And one time we were playing with each other and he said, Twinkie, you hear that little Clark influence in my music? I said, yeah, Tommy, but can you hear that little Tommy effect in mine? So I thank God that we were able to share musically in the ministry together. And one song that influenced me to kind of put that style in my music was I tried him and I know him. And I'd like to do a line of that. He had this unique style that I hadn't heard other musicians do. And that is putting the words and the phrasing out of the normal timing. So if you didn't have rhythm, you couldn't flow with the beat. Such a great loss. Right before she sings, she also says, but this is a time for us to get ourselves together, just like the musician or the choir director says um, that I recounted in the very beginning. Can you play the next clip too? I up and say, I'm going home. He saved my soul and he made me home. There's none like him. Hallelujah. I kind of got this. He saved my soul and he made. It's the part, there's none like him. It's the, it's, you probably don't necessarily hear it, but can you play the next clip? The next clip is not of the Clark sisters. It's not of Thomas Whitfield singing. It's a song that Thomas Whitfield wrote. Um, the title I'm forgetting right now because I'm old, but there is the rhythmic move that he does in this song, which title I'm gonna find as you play this, please. Ah. believe this is 1976 when Thomas Whitfield recorded this. This song is called My Father's Kingdom, recorded with the voices of Tabernacle, um, which is a church in Detroit, Michigan. Um, anyway, from a VHS cassette now available on YouTube, it wasn't until hearing Twinkie's description of her now deceased friend that I was able to understand his musicality and genius quality how phrasing doesn't match the beat and how that refusal doesn't have to match. Instead, the intentional separation of the place, um, the intentional separation is a place to sonically dance and play and improvise. The space between rhythm and lyric and rhythm and instrumentation is the place in which worlds of possibility are imagined and enacted. I did not remember the words of the choir director from the 1990 recording as I began to write this, but I remembered the repetition of the rewatching and awe and disbelief. I hadn't watched as an adult for at least 25 years, though I could easily recall how I felt watching it. This musician left an impression and an immaterial mark and touch and, and a touch of sadness too. 
So seeing his flesh speak those words about weight loss and incredulous doctors, but God's healing power stunned me and made me remember because the kinds of people that were disappearing were the kinds of people that I knew I had an affinity with, even though I did not want to be like them at that time, because I did not want to be like that, because the church said that they were sinners in an abomination. Perhaps I was one too. At 12 years old, I was afraid that the Delaware Valley choir director's fate would be my fate too. And there were so many others that I knew um, and did not know that were also dying. Writing about this very specific place, um, the Delaware Valley of approximately 2,000 square miles, journalist Rhonda Graham in 1994 stated the following, quote, since 1991, at least 14 musicians, um, 14 singers and musicians have died between Middletown and Philadelphia, a regional circuit for gospel musicians. In Kent County, about 10 singers and musicians and civilian choirs have died since 1990. A small music community in three years lost 14 performers. Um, I'm sorry, a small music community in four years lost 24 performers, folks that no doubt were active in their church homes, were friends, had family, had jokes, had favorite foods. How do the ones integral, however, to a way of life also get disappeared? On the 1992 album cover of this same choir, an image of the now deceased choir director hovered over the choir. The image's opacity at maybe 60%, you can see literally through him, his flesh now porous and ghostly. From the 1992 album, I as a 12 year old listened to a song about being thankful for God's mercy. The song is a long form lament regarding the various things the person did, um, the person singing it did, um, wrong in their life, but also how they needed to be a better person and change their behavior. But what does this mean to me as a 12 year old who was at the time terrifyingly really experiencing attractions that were uncomfortable and unexplainable and undeniable? I listened on my Walkman to the song about mercy over and over again, because I hoped I would not die with the thoughts of a boy in my head or like that choir director did. Renunciation is the problem of our current order. And I argue that glib responses to, it, to the AIDS crisis is one way that we can sense the renunciation of friendship, the renunciation of care, and the renunciation of possibility. So many sermons in the 1980s and 90s were about the problem and crisis, supposedly, of queerness infiltrating the church. Everyone from gospel artist and famous pastor, Reverend Clay Evans, to evangelists in the Church of God in Christ, Francis Kelly, and so many others. But this renunciation actually functioned more than just the general unkindness to musicians, choir directors, and singers directly impacted by the health crisis, because there was also the making invisible of labor, um, work, and relation. What was made invisible was the work of women musicians as well, because the music department became a department to pay attention to the masculinity of the department and the failures of men, so much so that women get actually erased from the concept. Musicianship gets rewritten as a masculine and manly profession precisely because many of the deaths of the musicians, um, because, some, because some come to think about the need for music to be a recovery of an over masculinity. It's why you get a different sound in gospel music around about 1996. Perhaps it's why we forget the various kinds of women that have contributed things to gospel music. And so the final thing that I want to do, um, so that's from the book. The final thing that I want to do is to show some of the installation that I will be preparing for, or that I have been preparing for the National Mall in the United States. Um, the exhibit will be opening in August. If you can click through to the next slide, I think. Yes, um, this was the first design, so we can move to the next one. <laughs> this was not the first design, it was one of the designs. Um, and so the installation is titled Homegoing, and it's titled Homegoing because it is a installation in three sound sections that will be honoring the lives and um, the lives of these musicians, choir directors, and singers who died unceremoniously. Homegoing ceremonies in Black community is really, really important. It's the 
it's the funeral celebration for a person. Um, it's the time when you celebrate the life of the person, what they meant to the community. You sing songs that they would have liked. Um, you have family that come up and say words. But often with these musicians, family would say things like, my son wasn't that way, or my son got saved at the end, or a lot of embarrassment and shame. And so the home they weren't homegoing ceremonies. They were services often for family to... Um, adjudicate the sinfulness or not sinfulness of their kid when they had them because some family chose to not even have public ceremonies at all. And so home going is an attempt to have a public and group ceremony for the various musicians who in my thinking and feeling still exist within this plane of existence because they have not been given a proper ceremony. And so it is an installation in three sections. The two things that look like a um, HRC equal sign, that wasn't purposeful. It was supposed to be a sound or a light installation, but National Mall would not let me do light. Um, that is a sound section. That is a song that will be played, written by Jerome Ellis, who is a poet and musician and composer and myself. Um, it's about 10 minutes long. And it's a mostly droning, repetitious song. And the first section, this equal sign section, is titled Procession. And so people can move in any direction they want to around this procession section and hear this 10 minute song that will have the names of musicians, the first names of musicians who died of AIDS complications over the music that is being played. The second section, which looks very squarish. This is a Kufi scripting of an Arabic word. The Arabic word is Amin, which means let this prayer be accepted. Um, the reason why I chose this as the ground plan, you can move to the next slide too, by the way. The reason I chose this as a ground plan um, is because I want, have been trying to, in all of my work, point to the relationship between Black Christian song making and um, Afro-Islamic practices of prayer, because it's true. Um, and so using an Arabic word, I mean, for me, is one way to join these communities together through sound. And so people will be, these are benches that will be two and a half feet from the ground. So you can sit on them, you can walk around them. They're ADA compliant. And so wheelchairs can get through them as well. Um, but the second section will have four songs and the four songs are songs that I've written. You'll hear some of that today. Um, the four songs are songs that I've written that take songs I've taken three musicians that I knew who died of AIDS complications, entered two songs from each of the musicians into like a unique word finder, and then chose different words to be keywords to construct new songs with. Um, so their lyrics are the lyrical foundation for new songs. Also their um, chord changes and melodies are the foundation for new songs, but they are not, we're not actually singing any of the songs that they um, actually created. None of the songs are written to God intentionally because absolutely not. Um, and then in the third section, it's a ring, which is a portal. And this, so the middle section, I'm sorry, is titled Sanctuary. And then the third section is titled um, Benediction. And so in that section is a song that is also written by myself and Jerome Ellis. And this is the section where people whose souls still remain here can exit through the portal to find a new kind of existence if they so desire. Can you hit the next slide? So this is a clip from one of the songs. We're not going to play all of it because we ain't got no time, but um, maybe a minute of this, if you can press play. This is from Benediction. I'm sorry, from Procession.
you can hit the next clip. But just really quickly, um, that's me. These are all demos of what the songs will actually be. But um, the squeaking that you hear is me playing my Hammond organ, which is it actually needs to be serviced. So it sounds squeaky. This is a song titled Go On Beyond Glory. Uh, you can press play and then like kind of click in the middle. Just blow it up. Go on below. Go all pro tools and my shaky voice y'all and my organ um this is a song it's time to rest and you can do the same thing sort of click in the middle once you press play future so apparently i have expensive taste <laughs> so
So the first however many designs, they were like, you can't afford that. You can't afford that. You can't afford that. We have a budget, $200,000. I didn't know how much I could afford. So I was like, I had lofty goals. Um, you can hit the next. Uh, you can, It looks like a chapel. So in the future iteration of this, hopefully the first iteration of this will lead to more funding because I actually wanted to build a ghost chapel where it is a structure of a church, but just the the beams of the church are the structure and then had the sound in three different sections, but inside of this ghost structure. So that's all this is. Um, thank you all for paying attention to some of that. I'm sorry it was so long. Thank you so much um, for that extraordinary presentation. Uh, um, I'll take the moderator's prerogative to ask a first question and let me invite everyone to, while I formulated and while while we go forward with it uh, everyone else to think about what questions you might want to ask um, you are welcome to post questions into the chat uh, or you're welcome to raise your hand and then you can um, ask it audio visually well yeah so much there I mean I want to ask you something which is kind of about maybe a different topic in a way although it's really about the parallels between them, if that makes any sense. I mean, I want to ask you about the university um, yeah. as a structure. And but I, there was so much you talked so much about the church and I I have no relation really to any church. Yeah. Um, and yet there was so much resonance with so many, some of my experiences with the university. Um, you know, on the one hand, there's so much struggle. And some, you know, when you mentioned um, what you said about renunciation was really, really interesting when you talked about renunciation of care. I think, you know, we're experiencing that a lot in universities and there's all these struggles now that in this country, there's huge union struggles with the universities, absolute renunciation of care in the U.S. There's these state laws being passed in collaboration with universities to not teach critical race studies or, you know, any kind of critical studies at all. Um, and and then and then at the same time, so many of us are, you know, in some ambiguous, complicated mixed relationship with the university where it's also a home and then at that last one when you were when you were um showing the image of this ghost chapel and i thought you know in some ways that's how i think about the university like to imagine a ghost university like what are the things that can be pulled out or how can the forms be taken and 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 opened up so i but i am really just also just curious to hear like how you navigate the university as an institution how you navigate kind of um, I think because a lot of times I feel like people feel like the, the real work that they're doing is in the is in the teaching, which, of course, can be a kind of a sacred space, even though the university renounces spirituality in so many ways. But also in terms of research and in terms of how you kind of the different aspects of your of your work, how that how, that, how you negotiate those contexts. Um, thank you for that question. People often get annoyed when I'm say what I'm about to say, which is I'm not a good academic. And that doesn't mean I haven't been successful according to their rubric, but I'm not a good academic because like, you know, we have tenure track in the States. I didn't know what that was, literally. And I don't even say that as like a form of celebration as much as when I went to grad school, I knew that I wanted to teach and I knew that I wanted to read books and write. And so I went to grad school because I was going to write books and I assumed I would get a teaching job, but I didn't know what people meant when they talked about tenure. I was just like, okay. And like, and figuring or finding out what tenure was along the way, like as I'm interviewing, it's like, oh, that's what this means. Um, that's a different way to say that the things that I do have not been particularly for the institutions because I don't, often know how these institutions work. And I think the same thing I could say is true for like my artistic practice and so far is I didn't do an MFA. I have taken like the art classes that I took were in elementary school. Miss Holmes, shout out to you because she always encouraged my art. She encouraged all of us as artists. We all took art classes in, in elementary school in the States for a long time. Now you don't, but I didn't know that there was such a huge division between like people that do art and people that write until like I started to encounter like people who I thought I was like 
cool with who are artists who stop speaking to me literally when I started like making art. <laughs> it's like, oh, we can't talk anymore. Um, and so I have I I don't do these things for these institutions. I do them because as agnostic as I am, I still feel a strong sense of calling. Um, and the thing that I'm trying that I feel called to constantly is like to reckon with the past, um, to reckon with harm, to to be truthful about it. Um, I've always been one that's just going to say what I feel. I try to say what I feel now in a much more sort of research ba- research based way. I used to just respond quickly without thinking, and I, I'm much I don't do that anymore. But I do feel strongly that I just try to say the things that I think are necessary to say that I feel I, I feel an urging towards saying. And in that way, I navigate the space of the university by saying this is a job. Um, it is one that I sometimes enjoy. I'm not one of these people that doesn't enjoy teaching. I have classes that I don't enjoy teaching because the dynamics of this particular semester aren't good. But I, I love teaching because teaching is one of the places where I get to share with the excitement of things that I enjoy and things that have transformed the way that I think. Teaching is one of the places where I can do that, where I feel I can, I'm excited about this and hopefully my excitement will convey to you and you can become excited about this or some other thing in the way that I'm excited about it too. And so like teaching is for me a job that I am sometimes excited by. The institutional practices of universities are things that I think are trash. And so I, you know, stand in solidarity with and protest with folks who are unionizing for grad student labor, who are unionizing for adjunct labor, because the casualization of labor is a general problem that we are experiencing. And not investing my sense of identity and I'm a teacher at UVA. I just I just refuse. I refuse that logic. And I and being part of other institutions like church (laughs) is like the first place where I had to learn that your sense of self cannot be this place because what happens when you leave this place? I left church because I felt like it, because I felt like, and not, I mean, I left conservative church because I felt, oh, y'all are homophobic, but I left progressive church because I felt like, oh, you don't care about empire. You don't, you don't care about like military. You don't care about like police violence, that this is, this progressivism is just liberalism, and this is actually not liberation either. And so if I can't invest my sense of self and relation in the institutional structures, I have to um, ground my sense of self and relation in the relations that I have with people. And in that way, it lets me be, you know, People don't like it anymore, but I can be in the university not of it a little bit. But you know, I also am a professor. Um, but just not investing, literally not investing my sense of worth and self. And I know, I know someone who got you know they got tenure and they like tattooed the name of the institution on their arm and put tenure and I was like that could never be me because I literally don't care (laughs) about any of these places I just don't I just don't because that is not I have friendship and friendship is really I have real deep friendship and relationship and like that is what I want my life to be produced by not like oh you teach at UVA like yes so I mean, like, I get paid. It's a it's a check, and I I receive resources to do some of the things that I want to do, and most of the things that I do with the resources they don't know about because they don't understand it. Like, oh, you're an artist too, and so I also don't get a lot of institutional support. Um, and I've tried. I don't get because you're you're not an artist. 
and then when I try to do artsy things, well, you're 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 a scholar. You don't you don't you're not a real artist. And so it's like it's just gotta. I just try to do the things that I do. Can I follow up with that by asking you to say a bit more about um, spirituality and the sense of calling, um, particularly where you know you talked about leaving the church and even the progressive church. And then, of course, university is a place that um, renounces spirituality. I know you're editing a book on spirituality and abolition. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about how you think about spirituality, given all that. Well, I mean, it's compl- I think that spirituality is a deep longing to be in community in relation with, with otherwise than oneself. And... Um, I don't like the phrase spiritual, but not religious, but not for the reasons that people who say they don't like it don't. I don't like it because I am totally okay with ceremony and with ritual. Like, and religion is ritual and ceremony in a kind of ordered fashion. I'm totally, like, I like ritual. Ritual is beautiful. But like, ritual when it becomes doctrinaire, (laughs) is the problem uh, no this is the only way that we can do it like no like that's and so like what i think about when i'm sort of thinking through trying to sense for and feel spirituality is i'm really trying to think about how am i in relation with the thing that i call myself and also with everybody else like how can and what gets in the way of those relationships and when things are in the way of, the, of those relationships, there is still this thing in me that is desiring relation. What is that? And for me, that is the thing that is not contained or um, controlled by our finite sense capacities. Um, I wrote this thing about neutrinos a couple of years ago, and it's, you know, 100 trillion neutrinos pass through every squinch, square inch of everything every second and it's like i said it i don't know what it means like we don't have a mental capacity to to understand 100 trillion any things let alone 100 trillion of those things in a small thing happening every small thing and yet it is what is the foundation of everything that we can sense even like whatever sense capacity you have available, sight or sound or touch or smell or whatever combination you have, that our ability to to sense things is because of this thing that exists all around us that we can't tangibly sort of or cognitively understand. Like we can say it and don't understand it. And for me, that's a beautiful thing because it is, it is the way that I sense like what spirituality is, which is like there is this way, there is this form of relation that exceeds our capacity to name. It exceeds our taxonometric um, or our, our taxonometric impulses of this per- particular political, economic ordering of the world where you got to name everything. It's like, no, there are things that ex- exceed capture. And it's like friendship, because friendship exceeds the capture of a certain kind of order because it's not institutionally given, institutions can't withhold it. it And, you know, people feel the ways that they feel about Foucault, but I think he's right in friendship as a way of life. It is a it's an inventional way of life. It's A through Z. You figure it out with the people that you are friends with. People can't tell you how to be friends. You figure out friendship in your doing of it. And for me, it's like that is another kind of thing that exceeds the or that overcomes or that cannot be contained or engulfed by the kinds of logics and rule based ordering that um, so many ways that we're told we have to be um, try to contain us to. And so spirituality is like the the ongoing desire for whatever that thing that overcomes or that that moves against or over or under or some other kind of relation that that doesn't need the centralizing logic. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I feel. Thank you. Um, are, are there other 
other questions that people would like to raise? There's someone in the chat mentioned the beauty of reparative theft. That was more of a comment. Here's a question. When you begin explore, when you begin exploring an idea, how do you know what the output will be? Book, art, music, does the genre call for a different practice? Yes to the second question. The first question, do I know? I have no idea what it's going to be. Um, you know, I don't know how my, I have to figure out a way to do it. But like the 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 everything that I think about the Hammond organ begins with the incident that happened when I was a kid. Every single thing. My father got into an argument with my brother who was a musician for the church during Sunday school. This happens before the church service begins. And my father slapped my brother with the Sunday school book, which was like a huge mistake because the church service was awful because my brother just sat on the organ and refused to play the organ. And there was nothing that anyone could do to make him do anything. And it was the first time that I said, oh, wait, the the preacher thought he was in charge but it's actually the musician that's in charge in the event of the church service and in that way it actually like once i get older and actually think more and more about it it's like oh this is about power <laughs> who holds power in any particular moment in any particular time my father was embarrassed about something so that was why he responded the way that he did but like that embarrassment is also about like feeling disempowered <laughs> and that feeling disempowered then gets put onto someone else. And it's like, actually what you found out is, is the literal last time anything like that ever happened because of like, Oh, if you do this, I will make this a terrible experience, not just for you, but for the rest of the congregation. And that's where my literal thinking about the Hammond organ began. And I initially was writing a book. I started it in 2018 in earnest. Um, the last, the coda of Black Pentecostal Breath was the direction of the Hammond organ book. It's about the Hammond organ and the place of Black church. And what I wrote was none of that is going to be in the book because the more I thought about the ham and organ and did a symposium with some people and a friend talked about the AIDS crisis, when she talked about the AIDS crisis, that's when I got the book. I said, oh, this is what the book is. And initially I tried to, after I said, this is what the book is, and I tried to contain it to like one part of one chapter. And the more I tried to contain it to one part of one chapter, I said, well, maybe it could be a whole chapter. And then the more I tried to do just one chapter, it was like, well, maybe it's the whole story. And the more, and so that's a long way to say that I try really hard to allow the things to be what they are and to dictate to me what they should be. Um, the Lonely Letters was not supposed to be the second book. It wasn't supposed to be a book. I mean, it was like a collection of things I was posting on Facebook a long time ago. And as I was like refusing to do book talks, I was like, well, let me read from these letters that I had written a long time ago because I don't have to write anything new. And the more I kept reading them, the more I felt like, oh, there's actually more there. So I ended up changing most of them and writing a whole slew of new ones. And I was like, okay, so maybe that'll be, it felt like this thing still needed to be written. And so I started writing that. And I feel like writing the lonely letters is what gave me the latitude to practice my art intentionally as a part of my scholarly practice, which is why it's like 19 paintings in the lonely letter. I had to fight for that, but I got it in there. And then it became, now I'm writing fiction. My dog is doing things, so. Now I'm writing fiction, and I feel like The Lonely Letters is literally what opened up a way for me to think in a semi-fictional register so that I could then begin to actually write in a fictional register. So I think that the, the things dictate what they, what form they need to take. And so I just try to file. I'm, I am Pentecostal at the end of the day. 
a non-God believing Pentecostal. I follow the, the movement or the leading of the spirit. What is the spirit? I don't know. But I do try to follow the the hunches, the what would happen if you do this? I'm I'm really that person. Like, I wonder what would happen if you do this. Let's try it and see what happens. And so, um, and the the installation, I was talking to a friend of mine just about installation work in general, just like, oh, how do like artists do installations? And as we were talking, I said, oh, I should do an installation for these musicians that I'm writing about. That was 2021. Yeah, 20, it might have been 2020, but maybe it was 2021, like January 2021. I said that, and that's kind of where the idea for the installation came from. And so um, sometimes I just kind of say things out loud that feel like promptings, not from me, but from the other world. I don't believe in the other world, though, so it's kind of, it's real hard. (laughs) Uh, are there some other questions? Would anyone like to? Uh, oh, okay. how did you meet Jerome Ellis and form this collaboration with the story behind this? I was amazed by the black loops and the loops of retreat track, as well as the idea of disfluent. Uh, Jerome's idea. Oh, I should read this out loud for the recording. Yeah. How did you meet Jerome Ellis and form this collaboration? What's the story behind this? I was absolutely amazed by black loops and the loops of retreat tracks, as well as Jerome's idea of disfluency. You know, um, I don't know how we, we've never met in person, which is part of that is pandemic time. But um, either I had started listening to some of Jerome's music that I found on Apple Music because I really like deeply repetitious kinds of things. And I think Jerome maybe had reached out to me uh, to talk about the book that they had just done, the blue one, whose title I'm forgetting right now. Um, and they were saying that Black Pentecostal Breath was helpful for that. And so th- I think there was just a mutual appreciation of each other's work without knowing it. And I think we like following each other on Instagram. And I had been listening to Jerome's music anyway, and I knew I wanted something different for um, procession and benediction. Um, Everything in in sanctuary sounds like gospel choir, church, and that's intentional. I wanted something that sounded different for procession and for benediction, and I couldn't think of what I wanted to do, but I kept listening to Jerome's music, like, I want something like this. And so I reached out to Jerome, and we were both like, oh, you like my work? I like your work. I think your work is great. I think your work is great. And so it was a great just moment of synthesis, um, because we've both been thinking around a lot of the same lines of flight. in our own thinking and our practice. And so the collaboration has been really, really nice and organic and not difficult at all. Like, oh no, this I like this vibe, let's do this. And so that's that's how it's been. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Does anyone want to turn on the video and ask? Okay, we have another question in the chat. I'll read it out loud. On the note, uh, returning to this note of rep- reparative theft. What are some of the things you do to redirect university resources elsewhere to do what you want to do to repair harm, to experience joy? Um, I try to hire people to do things. Um, So this installation that I'm working on, I am paying, you know, taking a lot of this budget that I didn't, that I thought was more than it was, but apparently it's not a lot. But I've been taking a lot of the budget and like paying people to do the kind, the work that they do um, to help me realize this installation that has to be a group project anyway. Um, so I do a lot of those kinds of things. I do symposia where I bring people who are not academics in quotes, um, not academics, 
um, because I think it's really important to have voices that are representative of different kinds of communities, but people who are really committed to this kind of ethical, um, necessary, urgent work. Um, and so I just, I take whatever resources I have and I try to make sure that they are used in the service of providing opportunities for other people to do the things that they do, not things that I, like, don't do a thing for me exclusively if it's not going to be useful for you, but to help you to do the things that you have already been doing. Stop bothering me, my dog. Um, and I watch, I mean, to experience joy, I, I watch cartoons a lot. I just finished Avatar The Last Airbender. Again, I watch it at this point like once or twice a year, the entire series. And I like Legend of Korra too. No one likes Legend of Korra. I think Korra is a perfectly fine, I think it's an amazing follow up to the show actually. But, you know, um, and that for me is about stealing my own time from the, from the university that I'm not one of these people that's trying to spend all day every day answering university emails and I I try I I'm there for my students and my colleagues I get you when I can so um and like really really being intentional about my own time and rest and and my pleasure in like sleeping and TV. And holding other. Sorry. I was just saying I don't belong to them. Like you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other questions um, that anyone would like to pose? It's time for maybe. Another one, if there's anything out there, um, or if anyone wants to come in audio visually, mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, we can wrap up. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank and you. I want to thank everyone also who came and um, witnessed it and um, asked questions and was involved. Uh, please um, continue to share um, the information about the next four talks in this series. And we'll hope to see some more. There's well, oh, here's a question. Are there? Oh, that's a really interesting question, actually. Are there dream people you'd like to work with? Like, who out there would you like to work with if you want to put anyone out and in, out into the universe? <laughs> that is a really interesting question. Are there dream people I want to work with? Yes. Do I want to name them publicly? Mm, mm, mm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Because people are, you know, that's fair. I the answer is yes. There are dream people that I would like to work with. There's like a. I can't say I have a dream project. So I did this thing, um, and people feel about him. It's okay. I say this about everything. I guess at this point, but um, Steve Reich has a song called Music for 18 Musicians, which was first recorded in 1976. It's one of my favorite things. I love it. And I recorded a um, piece titled Yes, Lord, that um, incorporates a choir singing the words yes or the words yes, Lord um, on each of the movements and the sound of a Hammond organ is playing the Hammond organ as well, because for me, it is a churchy song in a very specific kind of way. Um, the Dream Project, I don't want to necessarily work with Reich as much as I do want to do this project live, which would be really expensive and also really difficult because working with an orchestra of 18 musicians plus a Hammond organist plus a choir just gets unwieldy but i did the recorded project i think was really successful and i am hoping to be able to do it live hopefully next year or if not um at least 2025 so i'm working towards that dream goal um and i don't know 
there are a couple of orchestras that I would like to work with, but so far, I was working with one. I thought we were going to do it, and then they like literally haven't heard from them. Like we were supposed to have a meeting, they didn't show up to the meeting, and no responses to check-ins or anything. But it's that's a dream project of mine, and I'm hoping to at least be able to do that. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Great to meet you too. And thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate the time.